I followed the tracks and I found this one. I looked all around for the tracks and then I saw him. Lungkata, blue tongue. Blue tongue. So he just walking and you grab yeah. him? Yes, I took him. Dinner. Dinner. I'll hit him and then take him and cook him over there and cook him in the fire. I'll cook this meat, Lunkata, the blue tongue. It's good meat. I'll eat him after. Before becoming Josephine's lunch, Rebecca wants to document the find with modern techniques. Now, vent length is 245. So if you can hold that for me. Ready? So we take a little bit of the tail, yeah. of the tissue sample. Yeah. If reptiles can survive in this dry zone, it is partly because the desert is exceptionally green. People have a perception of deserts, like all deserts, as being rolling sand dunes devoid of vegetation. But in Australia, we have the oldest deserts in the world. They're classified as about a million years old. So the vegetation we have here is incredibly well adapted to the desert environment. In an area like this, you wonder why all the vegetation just doesn't die completely. Each of them has different adaptations. Some will store water, some have very, very good root systems. And a dune such as this, if you bury a hand down into the sand, is degrees cooler, um, only centimetres below the surface of the soil. This is a desert covered with plants and animals, and it's not your typical sand dunes. The dunes here are actually harboring life. The dunes are holding moisture, they're holding plants, the plants have insects, insects are being fed on by the birds and by the lizards. It's a whole complex food web. The plants in the desert here are pollinated by insects. Without the insects, the plants can't reproduce. A lot of insects here live on specific plant species, so those plants are like an island. It's an oasis, you know, in this desert. And so you have a whole community living on one plant. And then when they reproduce, the next generation might fly up, get caught in this wind, head down a bit, and who knows how far, several kilometers, and happen to land on the right house plant and then they can uh, start the cycle again. In the meantime, Barbara, an arachnologist or spider specialist, is exploring the edges of Lake Mackay, better known as Wilkinkara by the locals. It is over 75 kilometers from base camp at Kiwikura. During her career, Barbara has described over 600 new species. Yesterday, she visited the lake with some locals to set up some spider traps. Yesterday we went out with the aboriginals and they, they were a bit scared and they said that's magic here because they think that the souls of the deceased ones are going there. So, and it feels a bit like that. 
It's a kind in between, in between heaven and earth, so therefore they don't go that much on the, on the lake. It's really hard to pick up. It's in the sword. She knows that no animal can survive on this gigantic salt crust. It's on the edge of the lake that Barbara hopes to find life and new species of spiders. At the moment, there are about three and a half thousand described, and we expect about eight and a half thousand at least. So that's a male, a male wolf spider. This is a spider that has never been discovered to now and lives here in the desert. It's in burrows, so they can survive there when it's hot. It is surprising because it's a desert. And normally, if you are in a desert, you think that, um, that there is nothing. Underground, spiders are not the only ones to take shelter from the scorching desert heat. Honey ants, often illustrated in local paintings, are a living reserve of protein and sugars. The Aboriginal peoples appreciate them for their exquisite honey taste. Ah, look, there are honey ants coming out of this hole. There's ants down there? We're going to dig here. Sometimes they will dig up to 1.2 meters below the crust in search of the sweet caviar. The elders still offer them to their families as a tradition. Conscious that their ancestral know-how is being lost, they do their best to pass on the knowledge to the younger generation. 